Welcome to Forum 360. Thank you for joining us for a global outlook with a local view. I'm Leslie Unger, your host today. In 2022, the estimated total U.S. daily newspaper print circulation was down 8% from 2021. I'm in the shrinking contingent who prefers to read a print newspaper. 86% of United States adults say they often or sometimes get news from a smartphone, computer, or tablet. For news, I'm kind of in the growing digital contingent. But when it comes to magazines, there is still an appetite for something in your hands. In fact, two-thirds prefer having a hard copy in their hands to reading magazines online. I'm in the print for magazine contingent. Our guest today is editor of a monthly magazine format, the Cleveland Jewish News. Welcome, editor Kevin Edelstein. Thank you. I'm going to correct you. Uh, Please do. I'm sorry, I'm not the editor. Bob Jacob, my editor, would be mad if I steal his title. Um, I'm actually the publisher. Publisher. Yes. So, you know, tell us because years ago I had a client who was the publisher of the Akron Beacon Journal, and I mm -hmm. never understood. Can you tell us the difference between a publisher and an editor? Sure. So my official title is publisher and CEO of the Cleveland Jewish News, the Columbus Jewish News, and the Akron Jewish News, and I'm president of the Cleveland Jewish Publication Company and the Columbus Jewish Publication Company, which is the overarching umbrella of all of our products which are magazines and newspapers. We love you as, our, <laughs> as a loyal reader <laughs> yes. and uh, somebody that prefers that print product. But we also um, have a digital, digital division. We have an event division. We have a custom publishing division. Um, so we are doing a lot of different things. And the answer to your question is, what's the difference between a publisher and an editor? Mm -hmm. The publisher has um, overall oversight of the entire organization and um, is more than a figurehead. Um, I, I'd like to believe I'm more than a figurehead. Um, and our editor has um, responsibility of the newsroom, runs the newsroom, runs the day-in-day -day operation of the newsroom, is the one that is assigning stories, deciding what's going to go in the paper, what's going to, collaborating with our digital marketing team, digital marketing manager specifically to determine what's going to go online versus what's going to go in print, what's going to go in our e-newsletters. Um, hires reporters, manages reporters. Now, do you ever have a disagreement on what goes in as far as news, or is that clearly, are those, those um, areas cl clearly defined? It's a great question. Rarely will we disagree with each other. We will often, I have the final say as a publisher, but I'll never, okay. rarely, rarely, I'm not going to say never, I'll rarely pull rank. Um, we have a mutual respect for each other. Bob has been doing what he's been doing for a long time. Um, Bob was just inducted, in fact, last week into the Press Club of Cleveland Journalism Hall of Fame. Um, so he is a Hall of Famer. Um, I'll seek guidance from, uh, input from him. He'll come to me for guidance and input. Um, we, we're collaborators. Um, I trust him. Um, so if I don't, then I've got the wrong person doing the job. Sure, sure. Um, Collaboration. Well, that's a word we don't. Um, we we hear it, but we don't often often see yeah, it in action. We are firm believers in collaboration. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. never the smartest person in the room. I never want to be. I'm truly blessed to have an incredible team of journalists, of uh, business professionals, um, of designers, and, and marketing experts, and, and accounting experts um, to you know do what we need to do to get our job done. And and we're going to get into what what is a definition of a good journalist, but I want to go back in history first. Um, I know that you're having your 60th, and 2024 is we your are. 60th, but the roots of the Cleveland Jewish News began in 1889 and in 1906 um, with Excellent. the Hebrew Observer and the Jewish Independent. So in the 1800s and the 1900s, what needs did these newspapers fulfill? Um, oh my gosh, so much to be the eyes and ears of the Jewish community, to be the, um, the, not the protector, but the one that's capturing the history, the historical record, maintaining that, which is why we take such great pride in having over 150 years of Cleveland Jewish history available for free worldwide access through the Sam Miller Keeping Our Words Alive digital archive of the Cleveland Jewish News, which you can get to at cjn.org archive. 
And we've chronicled, we've, thanks to our uh, foundation, the Cleveland Jewish News Foundation, that oh, 10 years ago through the, six, the 50th anniversary of the Cleveland Jewish News, and their um, role in that, and their goal, I should say the goal of that, was to provide free worldwide access to the archive, which they've done. Okay, so when you say free worldwide access, is there an interest worldwide in the Cleveland Jewish community? Absolutely, for uh, because gene genealogy, for um, research, um, especially with, with the popularity of people's interest in learning about their history and um, the, the DNA kits that are being done to mm -hmm. look through your, um, especially with Holocaust education and finding out ancestry. So a lot of that, most of oh. that stuff was if you are in, if you were in Cleveland or Northeast Ohio at that time, you know, that was, chances are, that exists through the archive. Now then, how have the needs, so, so back when these, you know, um, the Independent and the Observers first started, you didn't and have... And the Yiddish of, the Yiddish of Welt, which was a Yiddish, Yiddish publication in Cleveland that served the Cleveland uh, Jewish uh, community um, that was most, a lot of it was, was, a lot of them were Yiddish speaking. So back then, you didn't have telephones, and so they couldn't share information. So how have the needs of your readership evolved? What are the needs of your leadership today? It's a great question. Um, it's immediacy. It's fact, truth, um, which is why we're available on so many different platforms, not just the week. I mean, we're a weekly newspaper. Columbus, we're a bi-weekly. Akron, we're a monthly newspaper. Each one of those communities has a, um, two out of three of them have a daily newsletter. All three of them have weekly newsletters. Akron's a weekly newsletter with a monthly mag newspaper. Um, but Cleveland has, we produce, you know, some days four newsletters a day that go out at different intervals of mm -hmm. the day. Today we sent out a breaking news in Columbus um, for that community because there was a change in leadership amongst one of their Jewish day schools. Mm -hmm. So those, those residents want to find out as soon as it's known. So I think that's changed with Facebook and Instagram and social media. I, was, I left our office today um, to come here, drive from Cleveland to, to Hudson where we're producing this and our t digital team was in the kitchen producing a video for, that we're gonna send out on TikTok about how to make latkes, healthy latkes in an air fryer. TikTok, That's what's TikTok happening. TikTok does have many different sides, doesn't it? It does, absolutely. But we're using that medium to reach that younger demographic who to have fun with it and provide information and how to. So you weren't doing that 10 years ago. You weren't doing that, certainly weren't doing that 100 years ago. There was the print, like you said, there was no telephone. There was, you know, it, it was the printed publication that got delivered to your door. Now, as, as a communication coach, I often counsel the need to be able to answer the why question. Why should I hire you? Why should I promote you? You know, why should I choose you? So why does the Cleveland Jewish News continue to exist now in 2023? Because there's a dire need for local community news, which there's, with all due respect to the daily newspapers across our towns, their, the economies of scale have prohibited them from really focusing on the local community journalism that should be done, that should be told by the local newspaper. So we've picked up that. Um, we're looking at not just the Jewish communities, but well, that's ahead, a, you have a question? I do when you say that because does a non-Jewish person have a reason to read the Cleveland Jewish News? We're making it relevant to them. So I'm not saying we're targeting the secular, the non-Jewish households across our communities. But if there's a story that's taking place in our community, and it's a, it's a heavily populated Jewish community, we're not going to hesitate to tell that story and dedicate the resources to do that. If a member of the Jewish community is involved, it's a no-brainer. I'll give you a case in point. Cleveland, Ohio, when they unveiled the beautiful, gorgeous um, chandelier in downtown at Playhouse Square yes. to christen the new look of Playhouse mm -hmm. Square. 
we had that on the front page of the Cleveland Jewish News that, at that time. People asked me, how is that relevant to the Jewish, Cleveland Jewish community? Some of the most frequent, frequent uh, guests of the arts in Cleveland are members of the Jewish community. Why don't they want to be, why don't they want to know about that? And why shouldn't we tell that story mm -hmm. about find the Jewish angle? And mm -hmm. that's what I'm talking about. So um, there's more and more of that happening today than ever before. So when you talk about the need for local news, just yesterday. Community news, specifically. Com community news. OK, so just yesterday, when I curled up with my old-fashioned paper Sunday New York Times, mm -hmm. OK, there was an article um, about the, the being signs that local coverage is, is being restored, that it is on an upswing. Do you find that to be true? Absolutely. We've dedicated more resources. We have more, head, we have more employees today than we did a year ago, and we dedicate resources to that. They, they might not be in one specific department, so we're expanding. So if we had, a year ago, we had eight people in our newsroom and two people in our dig, on our digital team, today we might have the same eight people in our newsroom, but we have three or four more people, three or four people total on our digital team because we're covering multiple different um, parts, parts of journalism, not just the print publication because we have all these digital, digital additional also. digital products. So when you talk about digital, just last week, um, they were replaying for some reason on, on so probably on Sirius Radio that I listened to, a quote from Fred Smith who had been CEO of FedEx. Mm -hmm. and, and it wasn't that long ago when he was asked about the threat, I think it was like six years ago or something, he was asked about the threat of Amazon. He's like, oh, it's no threat. It's no threat to FedEx and UPS. Mm -hmm. um, would, would, do you remember when, when news started going digital, did you think it would affect print journalism the way that it has? I did, um, because there's a shrinking population, as, as the population gets older, those people are the ones that grew up with the newspaper. They wanted to cuddle in their bed on, or their sofa with, with a, bl mm -hmm. a blanket on a Sunday afternoon and, and read the newspaper. Um, that demographic has, has gotten older and they're obviously, they're, we're losing a lot of those people. So there's a younger demographic, there's the Gen Z and the Gen X and, and the millennials that don't care about a newspaper. And we're figuring out ways to build a 21st century newsroom that caters to that demographic specifically. And what do they want, what do they want? How do they want to consume our um, content? So we're going we're gonna to cater them in 2024. We're going to build a news app and a community, local community app of our content to reach that demographic. We already have the funding for it, and we're going to do that. So one thing that I, I found out when I was kind of doing some research is that it's not just how many, say, houses get one of your print mm -hmm. um, monthly magazines or, or buy monthly magazines, um, because people can read it more people read that one magazine than one person in a house. Absolutely. So how do you figure out authentic readership? Well, because people, you would, people would ask us, how many subscribers do we have? And we correct them. It's how many readers do you have? And how do you, so do you guesstimate it's, that? It's typically, the, the m formula is typically two and a half readers per household. That's on okay. average. Now, there hasn't been a population study in Cleveland in the last 10 years. Um, it, there's going to be a new one coming out uh, time when the census is released, hopefully sometime in 2024. Um, so we'll have a better feel for how many Jewish households are there in each of our communities, but we average it typically two and a half readers per so household. It's not subscribers, it's readership. It's readers. Okay. Yep, it's eyeballs. Today we are talking with Kevin Edelstein, publisher of the Cleveland Jewish News in Columbus and Akron and, and a bunch of other things. Um, how has the rise, um, you know, this year, last year, four years ago, five years ago, how has the rise in anti-Semitism affected your, your paper, if it has? Oh, it, it greatly. Um, forget about the emotional toll that it takes on the people that are 
intimately involved in the covering of that mm -hmm. and assigning those stories and fielding those calls that are coming in and those those news tips that we get every single day from across the country, not just in, just in Central Ohio or Northeast Ohio. So a news Ohio. tip would sound like a, what? A news tip would be this took place in a outside a synagogue or at a Jewish day school or a local public school or even a church and in, in the community or was on the sidewalk. And then we have the difficult decision of task of deciding what's newsworthy. There's so much that takes place. So um, we often get criticized for being sometimes melodramatic and we don't create the news, we simply report it. We have an obligation just as any other news operation does to tell the facts without opinion, unless you're a columnist. Columnists have much more uh, leeway mm -hmm. than a reporter. There's mm -hmm. clearly uh, a definition of what the role of each one of those in the in the newsroom is. Um, and then then there's the, because there's so much of it, Leslie, that's taking place across our country and across our state, it's, it's incredible. Um, when you read ADL, reports from the ADL, and, and um, it, it's astonishing. So, we can't tell all of those stories. We rely on the wires to tell a lot of those. We subscribe to three wire services um, internationally. And have you seen, have you heard in people calling in or in the work that your reporters do, that same rise in um, anti-Semitism from the, the, your students on college campuses? Oh, absolutely. What's happening at Ohio State in Columbus I is sickening. What's happening, and they're not, they're not unique. It's happen look at the major other major institutions, look at the Ivy League schools mm -hmm. um, that's, mm -hmm. that's taking place. And, and unfortunately, we see it amongst ourselves. We're targeted. Me personally, members of my team have been targeted personally by people that are spewing hateful messages, attacks on us because we're in the business and because we're Jewish. So we take that very personal when it affects us. We take it personal when it affects other people. But again, we have a job to do and that is to report the news fairly and accurately. And I have a motto that, that every member of our team understands clearly. I'd rather be second and get it right than first and get it wrong. Well, then that leads me to, in a sentence or two, can you tell us what makes a good writer, say a good writer in, for a news format? Somebody that no, understands the who, what, where, when, why, and how, that doesn't bury the lead, tells the lead is, you know, capture me in the first paragraph, mm -hmm. we know what leads are. You know, the first couple sentences. What do I need to know? Why do I need to know it? What's next? And somebody that understands clearly that their opinion has no place in a news article. It, what makes a good story? If something is, is interesting, whether it's, it's good or it's bad, it's interesting, does that necessarily make a good story? Why do I need to know this? Why do I, as a reader, as a okay. consumer of my content, our content, why do I need to know this? How is this important to me? Okay. Because there's only so many pages in the newspaper. There's only so, we, now granted we can put anything we want online, but there's, so much, there's only so much newsprint available and it's all dictated by the ad, advertising sales. So I'd like to pivot for a moment and I'm gonna ask you something, I know you've talked about it publicly. Um, you know, um, I tell my clients that we don't cut ourselves in half and just take the, pr the professional side to work every day. We take the personal and the professional, and I don't think we, we can't separate that. So I, I wonder if you can share with us your family. I mean, I understand all families have challenges, and we all have challenges in life, but your family has had challenges, and you have a child that is a special needs I do. Child, and I wondered young how, adult now. how you can tell us that, it, how, does, does that affect how you do your work? How do I do it? I think there was a question in there is one word, and that's, well, wife, my partner. Um, without her, there's no way it gets done. Um, it does affect me, but at the same time, it affects me in my work because I'm constantly thinking about my children. I have a, um, child and a young adult son with special needs, and then I have a typical teenage daughter with, that's typical, and my single greatest worry in life, I tell people all the time, is my children, particularly my typical teenage daughter because she's so vulnerable growing up in 2023 mm -hmm. with all of all the noise that, that's around children today. So that is my single greatest worry. That is my single greatest responsibility above anything else that I do 
it's raising my children. And without my wife, I, I couldn't do it. But I, I tell our team all the time also that every single one of us, we walk through the door of our office every day. We leave behind, whether it's in our car, whether it's in our home, whether it's on the phone, whether it's anywhere, we leave behind crap that we all have. Mm -hmm. We all have to deal with that stuff. And we have to be mindful and respectful of each other to know when we come into work. It's not just me. As much as it might be a challenge for me to raise a child with special, a young adult with special needs who's gonna be 27 in a couple weeks, who wasn't supposed to survive past infancy 27 years ago, you know, there's, you know, I have members of my team that lost spouses, that, that lost parents this year, that lost grandparents this year. I just lost my dad, you know, several months ago, who was one of my best friends. We all have that. Mm -hmm. So we have to appreciate each other and be mindful of that and um, just do what, what we're here to do. You know, one of my questions that I often ask a guest is, what gives you hope? But I want to preface the question to you, what gives you hope? Because you talked about after that your special needs adult now um, is, was your first child. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of thought that went into having a second child. And so when I say, what gives you They're hope? 12 years apart. <laughs> that's really a hope. Um, so I'd like you to answer. You look at both personally and professionally and all that you see. Um, probably more close up than we do. You know, mm -hmm. people in the news business see more and you see it more close up than we do. What gives you hope? We just last week honored, last Thursday night, we had our uh, ninth annual Cleveland Jewish News 18 Difference Makers where we honored 18 members of the Jewish community of Northeast Ohio that are making impacts across their lives as well as a family of five, the Walliger family who are, mm -hmm. received the Generation Award and Michael Siegel who received the Lifetime Achievement mm -hmm. Award, the Sam Miller Lifetime Achievement Award. Those people give me hope. What they're doing in the community and the, commu the organizations that they represent and talking to my daughter and s hearing about what's going on in her school and the things that they're doing and trying to stay clear of, I mean, I'm exposed to the good, bad, and the ugly because of what I do. I try mm -hmm. to find the good and put the bad and the ugly aside and not everybody is bad and one bad apple doesn't spoil the lot. It, 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 it's that, that expression. So um, I, I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm, I'm by nature, I'm an, because of my mother and my father who raised me this way, I'm an eternal optimist. And I, I look at the glass as this water is, is half full. That's just, that's, I'm not being mm -hmm. arrogant. Mm -hmm. That's, that's sure. just sure. because I have to. And, and it, it's the power of positive thinking that, that um, I, I believe in. So I'm hopeful. Now, in the journalism world, and you can make that world as wide as you want, um, is there a journalist who inspires you? I'm inspired by a lot of journalists, not just one specifically. I'm a hero of Woodward and Bernstein um, because of what we all learned um, during that era. And I had the honor and privilege of, of um, going back full circle to the CJ and 50th anniversary our foundation brought in and the generosity of Milton Maltz, founder of the Maltz Museum, and Tamar Maltz brought in Woodward and Bernstein. And I had the honor of interviewing them in front of 900 people on a stage mm -hmm in Cleveland a decade ago, and that was such a thrill for me. And um, the journalists that inspire me are those that, that you can see the, you can just see the passion in them, in their writing and how they write. Um, I'll be biased, but Regina Brett is, mm -hmm. I hired her as a, you know, about nine years ago, I hired her as a non-Jewish, as a Christian woman to write a weekly column, and a lot of people don't like Regina because she's very, she's an open book. And you know, if you're not, if you don't subscribe to her, you know where she is politically. And, and you know, on, on the s political spectrum, if you don't believe in that, then you don't like her. And But we do have to go on record that she does have one of the cutest dogs. She ever. does. She absolutely. does. We have to next to my, with mine, next okay. to mine. <laughs> we got our dogs at the exact, almost at the exact same time. In just, um, in a couple words, um, do you read on Kindle? I do not. My wife does. My father did. Um, she inherited his Kindle, but I do not. What would you tell us um, is one of the best things about Cleveland? Oh, it's people. It's people by far. It's a great community. 
what makes a bad story? Is there such thing as a bad story? Or if it's a story, does that make it just... Um, what, one si something that's biased. You could clearly tell it's biased, one-sided. Um, and that's a bad story. Where do you go to for your news? I am a consumer of, I go to myriad of different publications. Give myriad, us three. Um, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, I'm going to give you four, CNN and Fox News because I have to be unbiased and I have to show um, balance. So I snuck in four there. Fair and balanced. Our guest today has at least two challenges on his plate every day he comes to his office. The challenges of growing anti-Semitism and the challenges of digital and print media. To paraphrase J.K. Rowling, we should be delighted people want to read, regardless of the platform they choose. Some of us pick up our phone to read the news or read a digital book. Others curl up with a print version of their favorite reading material. Perhaps next time you choose your preferred method, you will think about all the people touched by this changing technology. Our guest, Kevin Edelstein, publisher of the Cleveland Jewish News, among other uh, publications, shared some of his daily challenges in his world. I'm Leslie Unger. Thank you for joining us on Forum 360 for your global outlook with a local view. Forum 360 is brought to you by John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, the Akron Community Foundation, Hudson Community Television, the Rubber City Radio Group, Shaw Jewish Community Center of Akron, Blue Green, Electric Impulse Communications, and Forum 360 supporters.